Thank you. That was. We are taping this seminar yeah. for uh, CNA. Yeah. And I indeed appreciate the upload, but I would even more appreciate my presentation. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends and colleagues, uh, <coughs> I will give a kind of overview or a starting point for a more technical aspect of, of uh, this seminar and then will my colleagues with certain expertise in various areas uh, keep on. Uh, so, um, this is a duck herder from Vietnam outside uh, Ho Chi Minh City and I think the theme of today here that it, it's, it's a human, it's livestock and it's water there in the rice paddies and I think also some of you are aware of these uh, bugs called zoonotic agents that are jumping between humans and animals and I think quite a lot of those concepts related to it, that, that we do have in zoonotic diseases, you can apply that kind of thinking when we deal with uh, antimicrobial resistance. Well, do this. No, <coughs> I have to do that. Okay. Um, there are very different perspectives on livestock, and since we are in the midst of the urban jungle of Stockholm, I thought it could be. Um, important to remind those of you who are detached from food production that food do come from from um, from agriculture and it's it's very different perspectives these are the two extremes I think uh, this this woman here she is in in Vancouver or Stockholm or Amsterdam and so uh, she have a university degree in something um, she have one perspective on on livestock it's it's very different from this young boy he is belongs to the ethnic group Karamayong uh, people up in northeastern Uganda he will likely not have a, a university degree when he grew up but he will have a Kalashnikov to protect his his herd and even steal from his neighbors uh, so they have, of course, very different perspectives on, on the, the importance of livestock. And I think this is, this is on the State of Food of Agriculture, FAO uh, flagship um, uh, publication in 2009, uh, that this is a little bit in illustrated, that in, in post-industrial countries, it's, it's environment and it's human health that is the most important aspects of, of livestock. Whereas in, in low countries with low uh, development, it's the food security and the livelihood thing. And I think it's, we, we have to acknowledge this when we talk on the global level, that there, there are very different perspectives. And we have to respect uh, all kind of perspectives to be able to move forward, I think. Uh, <coughs> In the title, it was also said nutrition. And when it comes to, to livestock products, because livestock is, is the one that are using the antimicrobials in this, at this seminar, is, is the hidden hunger or, or the, the lack of micronutrients, which uh, animal source foods are very rich in these uh, essential micronutrients. And we have to acknowledge that it's an extremely, extremely asymmetric consumption of animal source foods in over the world. It, it, it's, it's such a difference. It's even more difference, different than the perspective of these two individuals I showed you in the very beginning. And two billion people are suffering from, from this so-called hidden, hidden hunger. And it's, it's, it's especially uh, dangerous for, for children under development during the first five years. They become stunted and, and that is uh, short in length and then also their, their cognitive development is, is hampered. So, so it's, um, it's um, a quite a sad story and animal source food helps a lot for, for this, especially milk have been shown to be quite solid data on that. Uh, so, in, in low-income countries especially, there is an increased demand and production of livestock products. 
particularly in poultry, and that is chicken and ducks and so, and, and pigs, and the largest expansion in East and Southeast Asia. And the main drivers are uh, increased incomes and urbanization are, are the most important ones. And this graph shows we have the GDP per capita here, and here is the uh, kilogram of, of meat consumed um, per, per capita over the years. Uh, the interesting thing here is around $35,000 a year, the, the curves start to, to, to flatten. And of course, there are, are big, um, big cultural, it, it, it's not only this. It's also big cultural differences, like, like the US is, is, is eating a lot and India is eating less because of the big population of, of uh, vegetarians. Uh, <coughs> but it's, it's important to, to remember a little bit that it's mainly Southeast Asia and Asia, where, where it, and it's mainly poultry and pigs. It's, it's, a, it's a little bit um, different. It's not even all over the world. Um, so. These species, uh, poultry and pigs, are suitable, if I put it like that, it's possible, to intensify the uh, rearing of these animals. And intensification is economically beneficial, and more importantly, perhaps, it's a better use of natural resources, including water. However, often this kind of, or too often, this kind of, of animal keeping is is uh, combined with often uh, extensive use or abuse of antimicrobial to protect against disease and production losses. Uh, you can say that you compensate poor management with high doses of, of antimicrobials. And as much, if, if you increase the use of antimicrobials, that contributes to the antimicrobial resistance. It's there are some data showing a very linear uh, relationship between, the, between, this, between the use and the, and the risk for antimicrobial uh, or the de development of antimicrobial resistance. Um, and so, and this is from The Economist in May. Um, so it is kind of an al alarmistic uh, discussion. And this is a chicken from, from the Mekong in, in, in Vietnam. Uh, so, a little bit about the use of antimicrobials, <coughs> just to put in perspective for you. Uh, it's a global estimate that more than 50% of, of antimicrobials are used in the livestock sector. However, in Sweden about just 15% are used in the livestock sector. In the US it's supposed to be about 70% used in the livestock sector. Uh, and this is an estimate from from uh, Van Buckel and, and co-workers from last year, that you could see hot spots of antimicrobial use in 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 the, in the world. Uh, however, these are assumptions, and and one should say it's it's fair to say that the global data on both on antimicrobial use and antimicrobial resistance are are very weak, both in the livestock sector and in the human sector. Because the legalizations and the policies and the recording and the methods for doing this and so are extremely variable. And I think the, here is a, is a need, even though I come from a university and always say we need more research money from the, for the universities, but I, I think it, it's important here to generate more data so we f um, do wise decisions uh, for the future so we're not doing stupid things. Uh, so, a little bit about the spread of antimicrobial resistance. To humans, it could, from, from animals, we're talking about from animals, uh, directly, I call it animal workers that are farmers, that are veterinarians, that are butchers, and so uh, it could be contaminated directly. But also foodborne and in, in the vet markets um, and also all kind of markets, but it, it could be contaminated with, with food, these bacteria. Uh, and to the environment and the, and the water, 
from factories. I, I'm sure that my, my colleague from Gothenburg will talk about that. Uh, <coughs> but also from manure and wastewater. And, and water will be a ve vehicle for, for antimicrobial resistance. And the resistance could be, it could be genes that jumping from one bacteria to another, or it could be bacteria that are moving between different host species. And here is just an example from our own research by, by my young colleague Gunilla Ström. In, in pig urban farming in Phnom Penh, the capital of Cambodia, there's quite a lot of pigs living in the city, uh, real pigs. Uh, in almost half of the farms, the manure was just dumped often in water. So, and, and that is of course a risk. And I think also we, we have the word peer urban and urban here. I think one could, it, it's very likely that the issue on antimicrobial resistance is is larger in peri-urban and urban uh, areas as these are it, the excess excess to, to antimicrobials are, are larger in ar around cities than in in, the, in in rural areas. So <coughs> reducing the antimicrobial use is 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 possible as the. the the vice minister said here, yeah. and, and uh, <coughs> there are many countries and nations saying mm -hmm. now that we are going to do this and see and so. Sweden, the livestock sector actually walked the talk, did this in the 80s, and it was, I would almost say it was a kind of kamikaze thing that it decided this, it was driven by the farmers, that is very interesting for me because, and, and I think my, my colleague Miss Salman will, will talk more about that, but it's important to know that it was initiated by the farmers themselves. Uh, and it, it was a very good cooperation between farmers, animal health services, researchers, and the policy levels. And you could, you could, this is a kind of conceptual picture. If you have livestock production here, that depends on animal health, and there are also other aspects like food quality, like genetic background, and so on and so. And in animal health management, antimicrobial use is a natural part, of course, but the Swedish farmers and these other guys managed to reduce this very much. And this is reflected here in this, this graph here. Sweden, the use is, is here. It's the European, uh, uh, European <coughs> Union data. Uh, the UK is also quite, quite low. Um, you could see others. Uh, the Netherlands is, is reducing, it's almost as low as U UK now after some years. Um, Denmark is quite low and so. But uh, Sweden is the far, and, and this is per animal unit. So it's, it's comparable uh, data and uh, this is one of the best uh, comparisons in, in, in data we, d we do have since the European Union have some kind of harmonized system for, for uh, saying this. <coughs> so with these words I, I just want to, to announce a little bit, uh, not stealing the, the, the duties for, for the moderator, but we will hear more about the water and envi environment nexus, the good or best practices from, from, from Sweden, uh, the government challenges from, from South Africa, uh, awareness in the livestock sector by my, my colleague Dila Grace from, from Ilri, and the joint forward action by, by Fran Lubrot in, in, at FAO. Thank you very much. There's a very, very exciting question here to ask you directly. Um, yes. You, you have been a part of this process the whole time. You followed the, the development from the beginning, from 1984 to now. I was very young at yeah. 1984. <laughs> But I, I, I was a veterinarian at that time, yes, already. But still you remember the process, don't you? All yeah, the time. yeah. What, what was the major factor that triggered this development? I mean, it, it, it has a story to learn about this. Yeah. I'll tell you when I'm busy. All right. I'll tell you so I can give you the answer later. Yeah. I could just speculate, but I, I've been, as a student and also now as a teacher at, at university, it, it, it's a mindset that you should be very restricted in using antibiotics. It, it's a mental, not brainwashing, but it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mindset, it, it's an attitude thing, which I feel it's quite different from other European colleagues, still. Okay, I can't wait for the answer, though, so we hurry on. <laughs> yeah. Next so uh, thank you very much for your presentation.